Story seven of The House with the Mezzanine and Other Stories by Anton Chekhov. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Story seven My Life The Story of a Provincial Part three. A railway was being built in our district. On holidays and thereabouts, the town was filled with crowds of ragamuffins called railies, of whom the people were afraid. I used often to see a miserable wretch with a bloody face and without a hat being dragged off by the police, and behind him was the proof of his crime, a samovar or some wet, newly washed linen. The railies used to collect near the public houses and on the squares, and they drank, ate, and swore terribly, and whistled after the town prostitutes. To amuse these ruffians, our shopkeepers used to make the cats and dogs drink vodka, or tie a kerosene tin to a dog's tail, and whistle to make the dog come tearing along the street with the tin clattering after him, and making him squeal with terror and think he had some frightful monster hard at his heels, so that he would rush out of the town and over the fields until he could run no more. We had several dogs in the town which were left with a permanent shiver, and used to crawl about with their tails between their legs, and people said that they could not stand such tricks, and had gone mad. The station was being built five miles from the town. It was said that the engineer had asked for a bribe of fifty thousand roubles to bring the station nearer, but the municipality would only agree to forty. They would not give in the extra ten thousand, and now the townspeople are sorry, because they had to make a road to the station which cost them more. Sleepers and rails were fixed all along the line, and service trains were running to carry building materials and laborers, and they were only waiting for the bridges upon which Dolikov was at work, and here and there the stations were not ready. Dubechnia, the name of our first station, was seventeen versts from the town. I went on foot. The winter and spring corn was bright green, shining in the morning sun. The road was smooth and bright, and in the distance I could see in outline the station, the hills, and the remote farmhouses. How good it was out in the open! And how I longed to be filled with the sense of freedom, if only for that morning! to stop thinking of what was going on in the town, or of my needs, or even of eating. Nothing has so much prevented my living as the feeling of acute hunger which make my finest thoughts get mixed up with thoughts of porridge, cutlets, and fried fish. When I stand alone in the fields and look up at the larks, hanging marvelously in the air, and bursting with hysterical song, I think it would be nice to have some bread and butter. Or, when I sit in the road and shut my eyes and listen to the wonderful sounds of a May day, I remember how good hot potatoes smell. Being big and of a strong constitution, I never have quite enough to eat, and so my chief sensation during the day is hunger, and so I can understand why so many people who are working for a bare living can talk of nothing but food. At Dubnechnia the station was being plastered inside, and the upper story of the water tank was being built. It was close, and smelt of lime, and the laborers were wandering lazily over piles of chips and rubbish. The signalman was asleep near his box, with the sun pouring straight into his face. There was not a single tree. The telephone gave a faint hum, and here and there birds had alighted on it. I wandered over the heaps, not knowing what to do, and remembered how, when I asked the engineer what my duties would be, he had replied, ah, we will see there. But what was there to see in such a wilderness? The plasterers were talking about the foreman, and about one Fidat Vasilievich. I could not understand, and was filled with embarrassment, physical embarrassment. I felt conscious of my arms and legs, and of the whole of my big body, and did not know what to do with them or where to go. After walking for at least a couple of hours, I noticed that from the station to the right of the line there were telegraph poles, which after about one and a half or two miles ended in a white stone wall. The laborers said it was the office, and I decided at last that I must go there. 
It was a very old farmhouse, long unused. The wall of rough white stone was decayed, and in places had crumbled away, and the roof of the wing, the blind wall of which looked toward the railway, had perished, and was patched here and there with tin. Through the gates there was a large yard, overgrown with tall grass, and beyond that an old house with Venetian blinds in the windows, and a high roof, brown with rot. On either side of the house, to right and left, were two symmetrical wings. The windows of one were boarded up, while by the other, the windows of which were open, there were a number of calves grazing. The last telegraph pole stood in the yard, and the wire went from it to the wing with the blind wall. The door was open, and I went in. By the table at the telegraph was sitting a man with a dark curly head in a canvas coat. He glared at me sternly and askance, but he immediately smiled and said, "'How do you do, Prophet?' It was Ivan Chiprikov, my school friend, who was expelled when he was in the second class for smoking. Once, during the autumn, we were out catching goldfinches, starlings, and half-inches, to sell them in the market early in the morning when our parents were still asleep. We beat up flocks of starlings and shot at them with pellets, and then picked up the wounded, and some died in terrible agony. I can still remember how they moaned at night in my case, and some recovered, and we sold them and swore black and blue that they were male birds. Once in the market I had only one starling left, which I hawked about, and finally sold for a kopeck. A little profit, I said to console myself, and from that time at school I was always known as Little Profit, and even now schoolboys and the townspeople sometimes use the name to tease me, though no one but myself remembers how it came about. Cheprakov never was strong. He was narrow-chested, round-shouldered, long-legged. His tie looked like a piece of string. He had no waistcoat, and his boots were worse than mine, with the heels worn down. He blinked with his eyes, and had an eager expression, as though he were trying to catch something, and he was in a constant fidget. "'You wait,' he said, bustling about. "'Look here. What was I saying just now?' We began to talk. I discovered that the estate had till recently belonged to the Cheprakovs, and only the previous autumn had passed to Dolokhov, who thought it more profitable to keep his money in land than in shares, and had already bought three big estates in our district with the transfer of all mortgages. When Cheprakov's mother sold, she stipulated for the right to live in one of the wings for another two years, and got her son a job in the office. "'Why shouldn't he buy?' said Cheprakov of the engineer. "'He gets a lot from the contractors. He bribes them all.' Then he took me to dinner, deciding in his emphatic way that I was to live with him in the wing and board with his mother. "'She is a screw,' he said, "'but she will not take much from you.' In the small rooms where his mother lived there was a queer jumble. Even the hall and the passage were stacked with furniture, which had been taken from the house after the sale of the estate, and the furniture was old and of redwood. Mrs. Cheprakov, a very stout elderly lady with slanting Chinese eyes, sat by the window in a big chair, knitting a stocking. She received me ceremoniously. "'It is Poloniev, mother,' said Cheprakov, introducing me. "'He's going to work here.' "'Are you a nobleman?' she asked in a strange, unpleasant voice, as though she had boiling fat in her throat. "'Yes,' I answered. "'Sit down.' The dinner was bad. It consisted only of a pie with unsweetened curds and some milk soup. Elena Nikifirovna, my hostess, was perpetually winking, first with one eye, then with the other. She talked and ate, but in her whole aspect there was a death-like quality, and one could almost detect the smell of a corpse. Life hardly stirred in her, yet she had the air of being the lady of the manor, who had once had her serfs, and was the wife of a general, whose servants had to call him Your Excellency, and when these miserable embers of life flared up in her for a moment, she would say to her son, Ivan, that is not the way to hold your knife. 
or she would say, gasping for breath, with the preciseness of a hostess labouring to entertain her guest, we have just sold our estate, you know. It is a pity, of course, we have got so used to being here, but Dolikov promised to make Ivan station-master at Dubechnia, so that we shan't have to leave. We shall live here on the station, which is the same as living on the estate. The engineer is such a nice man. Don't you think him very handsome? Until recently the Cheprakovs had been very well to do, but with the general's death everything changed. Elena Nikiforovna began to quarrel with the neighbours and to go to law, and she did not pay her bailiffs and labourers. She was always afraid of being robbed, and in less than ten years Dubechnia changed completely. Behind the house there was an old garden run wild, overgrown with tall grass and brushwood. I walked along the terrace, which was still well kept and beautiful. Through the glass door I saw a room with a parquet floor, which must have been the drawing-room. It contained an ancient piano, some engravings in mahogany frames on the walls, and nothing else. There was nothing left of the flower-garden but peonies and poppies, rearing their white and scarlet heads above the ground. On the paths, all huddled together, were young maples and elm-trees, which had been stripped by the cows. The growth was dense, and the garden seemed impassable, and only near the house, where there still stood poplars, firs, and some old bricks, were there traces of the former avenues, and further on the garden was being cleared for a hay-field, and here it was no longer allowed to run wild, and one's mouth and eyes were no longer filled with spiders' webs, and a pleasant air was stirring. The further out one went, the more open it was, and there were cherry-trees, plum-trees, wide-spreading old apple-trees, lichened and held up with props, and the pear-trees were so tall that it was incredible that there could be pears on them. This part of the garden was let to the market-women of our town, and it was guarded from thieves and starlings by a peasant, an idiot who lived in a hut. The orchard grew thinner, and became a mere meadow, running down to the river, which was overgrown with reeds and withy beds. There was a pool by the mill-dam, deep and full of fish, and a little mill with a straw roof ground and roared, and the frogs croaked furiously. On the water, which was as smooth as glass, circles appeared from time to time, and water-lilies trembled on the impact of a darting fish. The village of Dubechnia was on the other side of the river. The calm azure pool was alluring with its promise of coolness and rest. And now all this, the pool, the mill, the comfortable banks of the river, belonged to the engineer. And here my new work began. I received and dispatched telegrams. I wrote out various accounts and copied orders, claims and reports, sent in to the office by our illiterate foremen and mechanics. But most of the day I did nothing, walking up and down the room, waiting for telegrams, or I would tell the boy to stay in the wing and go into the garden until the boy came to say the bell was ringing. I had dinner with Mrs. Cheprakov. Meat was served very rarely. Most of the dishes were made of milk, and on Wednesdays and Fridays we had Lenten fare, and the food was served in pink plates, which were called Lenten. Mrs. Cheprakov was always blinking, the habit grew on her, and I felt awkward and embarrassed in her presence. As there was not enough work for one, Cheprakov did nothing but slept or went down to the pool with his gun to shoot ducks. In the evenings he got drunk in the village, or at the station, and before going to bed he would look in the glass and say, "'How are you, Ivan Cheprakov? When he was drunk he was very pale, and used to rub his hands and laugh, or rather neigh, he-he-he-he-he. <laughs> Out of bravado he would undress himself and run naked through the fields, and he used to eat flies and say they were a bit sour.' End of part three.